Hello, good afternoon, good morning, good everywhere. Everyone, um, welcome very much, uh, very welcome to the CFPR lunchtime seminar series. Thank you everyone for attending. Uh, just to say, um, as housekeeping, we are recording the session, so please let us know if you don't want to be, sort of your contribution to be um, included in the recording. Uh, but just to say that we have uh, restarted our CFPR lunchtime seminars uh, from today and we will be carrying on with the seminars uh, as a bi-weekly session. We'll start again after Easter uh, on the 14th of April and then carrying on uh, every two weeks after that at the same time of 12.45. So feel free to sit anywhere uh, and chat to anyone when we go back to the auditorium later. But I would like to introduce um, Laura Clark Oten, who is giving our um, uh, first inaugural uh, session at the moment. And there she is. Hello there. So Laura is our um, research uh, technician for printmaking, also an accomplished uh, artist and videographer and uh, by herself and uh, she has organized uh, and the <clears throat> real case exhibition at UE um, which uh, would in ideal times would have had a nice private view with champagne and everything else unfortunately uh, my champagne is out at the moment I've got my cup of tea here so you know well done Laura for putting it all together and looking forward to uh, to, to hearing and uh, all about it now. We've also, I'd also like to invite Wun Jin uh, to the for the presentation, who will be um, helping me with the chats. Please use a chat function if you want to have any uh, if you have any questions or comments for later. And Wun Jin and Laura will have a conversation about all this late after the after the talk. So Laura, I'll hand over to you and uh, enjoy everyone. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So yeah, thanks for the introduction, Frank. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm Laura. Um, I'm a visual artist, filmmaker, collaborative printmaker. Um, and like Frank was saying, I'm a research technician at CFPR. And um, the exhibition that is currently on at UE in the real cases is um, it's part of the Methods of Making series. And I was invited to do this exhibition by Suzanne Klein, um, Neve Fahi, um, Angie Butler and Sarah Bobman and basically it's the beginning of a, a series of exhibitions that are going to run through the year um, basically showing how a project um, sort of starts from its conception and then works through so usually with exhibitions you just have the work and you don't see that journey that comes through so this this exhibition shows you that journey from its conception right through to the, the finished article. And I think that's really nice. It gives people an insight into um, the way I was thinking at the time. And it's been good for me. It's been quite cathartic because I've not really shown the work in this way before. I've exhibited it lots of times, um, but not in this way. And it's been a nice way of deconstructing the project. So because there wasn't going to be a possibility of there being a private view. I made a short film um, that explains everything about the show and, and shows you the work itself in the real cases. So I'm going to put that up now and then you can all have a little watch. And then if there are any questions, just put them in the chat and then I'll be happy to do a Q&A at the end. It's only a short film. So um, I'll put that up now. All of the objects have their own history and stories of their own. I wanted to use them to create a new story, to birth a new life. I'm Laura Clark, and this is Wunderkammer as part of CFPR's Methods of Making series. The Methods of Making exhibitions take place in the real cases found around UE's Bauer Ashton campus and explore projects from the concept through to the finished project, a kind of show and tell about the adventure of creating a piece. When asked to take on this project, I wanted to use it as an opportunity to deconstruct a body of work I made called The Cadaver Room. The Cadaver Room was part of an exhibition I did a few years ago in an old Victorian butcher's shop, which was due to be renovated in London. The works explored the human and animal bodies and how beauty can be found in the grotesque. In this exhibition, 
the prints and sculptures are shown, but the journey actually begins with the objects. So having the chance to show the work again in the real cases, it seemed incredibly important to be able to show this journey from object to print back to object again, displaying the artefacts that I collected that were so integral to the project, but overlooked in the first exhibition. When thinking about how to approach the install, I really like the idea of the work being presented in a museological way, behind the glass and untouchable. My brain conjured up images of Wunderkammers or cabinets of curiosities, which commonly featured antiques or objects of natural history, like taxidermy or skeletons. Usually the objects displayed would have a very special significance. They would be rare, eclectic or esoteric. Viewers could gaze at the objects and imagine their historical connections, their stories. With the first real case, I wanted to show the objects exhibited in this way, objectified, glorified and under scrutiny. These objects and artefacts were my starting point in this project. They provided the imagery and the making of the prints and the altarpiece sculpture Exquisite Corpse. Objects like glass eyes, bull horns, a taxidermy cock, an old Victorian electrocution device, a porcelain doll, a sheep's skull, pigeon's feet. But this selection is only a small collection of the objects I actually used. Perishable objects are missing, for example, internal organs like placentas, hearts and tongues, as well as other body parts like breasts, penises, toes, fingers. These are missing for obvious reasons, but can be seen in the prints and the sculpture in the final real case. From the objects I have displayed, the viewer can get a glimpse of what might unfold in the coming real cases. These objects were chosen for their links to the body, to the abject, as defined by Julia Kristeva, and to their relation to what Mikhail Bakhtan calls the grotesque body. When seen as individual objects, they have their stories to tell, but one can only imagine the places they've been or the people they've affected. My aim was to bring all of these objects together to create one being, transforming them from object or subject to the abject. As Julia Kristeva puts it, abjection preserves what existed in the archaism of pre-objectal relationship, in the immemorial violence with which a body becomes separated from another body in order to be. I took inspiration from the surrealist game Exquisite Corpse, a collaborative drawing approach used by artists to create bizarre and intuitive images and created a net. In the second real case displayed is the research and designs that went into the making of the plates and their assembly to then create the sculpture. I wanted each image on each plate to fit together like a game of exquisite corpse, a tentacle meeting with a finger, a breast transforming into a heart or a foot with glass eyes, I researched many different archimedic shapes, shapes that would have enough facets for me to place the scans of the objects onto and that would allow me to further create a three-dimensional piece out of two-dimensional facets, shapes like isohedrons and dodecahedrons. The shape I chose in the end for this project was a cube octahedron, a shape made up of squares and triangles that when laid out to create a net of 14 facets and assembled together it created a beautifully structured spherical shape. In this real case, you can see the original workings out of the net and partly printed net of the facets that went on to make the sculpture. There is also a larger print of all 14 sides that I was able to exhibit in this exhibition that I will show you here. This piece is called Unraveled Cadaver. The nets are important and interesting because they create an ordered dissection of the piece, laid out, unravelled and exposed. All prints made in this project come from the etched copper facets that then become the sculpture Exquisite Corpse, which we then find in the final real case. Spinning suspended just above the plinth, we find the altarpiece sculpture made from copper plates, a 14-sided sphere upon which the boundaries of each facet divide one body from the other at their points of intersection. I wanted to display the sculpture in this way to give it a feeling of weightlessness, creating a feeling of liminality as though it is suspended between worlds. As it rotates, we see one body as it offers its death, the other its birth, and in doing so they are merged. 
As Bakhtan writes, each fragment belongs to those parts of the grotesque body in which it outgrows itself, transgressing its own body, in which it conceives a new second body. The scanned objects on each facet merge with each other, dismembered parts, separate organs, gaping mouths devouring, digits grasping and constricting, tentacles sucking, dripping, leaking. Through the etching of the piece and the intimacy that comes with the process, I become part of the sculpture, and through the reflections given back to the viewer in the polished metal, they too temporarily become part of the exquisite corpse. Okay, so that's that, that was the film. <laughs> so if there are any questions or anyone wants to have a chat with me about it, um, feel free, now's the time. That's always unmute yourself first. So thank you, Laura. <laughs> okay. For the for the for the presentation for and for the works that you've done, uh, putting it all together in the real cases in at Bauer. Now the real cases for those of you, of you who don't know um, are called real cases because they used to how house the uh, fire hoses uh, in the tower block in Bauer Ashton. So they are and that and when they took the the fire hoses out of those cupboards. Um, it was decided that we make them into sort of temporary exhibition spaces. So they are sort of um, scattered all over the buildings in, in Bauer Ashton, and we can sort of use them for exhibition spaces. So thank you for Laura for, for putting all of this. Uh, and yes, yeah, so we as so well hand over to Wun Jin um, to have a little chat with you. And maybe there's a couple of questions in the QA box on the right hand side as well. For those of you who haven't used Remo before, uh, there is a, um, a more button at the bottom right of the screen now. You can open that and then you can go to chats or the QA. If you use a QA section, then we can um, take it from there. Okay, I shall mute myself now. <laughs> Wow, Laura, that was really beautiful and um, uh, wonderful to see the backstory in your work. Um, there's quite a few people who are interested in um, how you generated this body of work and the technicalities behind it. So maybe we could start with, first of all, your conception and intent, especially the idea of the Wunderkammer being a portrait of the collector. So it feels to me that, you know, that all the objects that you've assembled give us an insight into who you are as um, and what you what you love and what your tastes are. So could you comment a little bit on that, please? Yeah. So, I mean, I've, I've, I've never really exhibited in such a sort of tightly, you know, confined space before. And it yeah, immediately just triggered the Wunderkammer because I have all of these objects and these objects never get seen. And if you look at any of my work that I've done, you know, previously, I always take, it's almost like collaging. So it's either collaging with two dimensional images or it's collaging with objects. And I thought it would just be a really nice opportunity to show these objects and, and to sort of display them in a sort of behind the scenes kind of way, because in themselves, they're all really beautiful. And I've obviously collected them all over time and seen them as significant enough to make them into a piece of artwork but they've never been seen as just the objects themselves but all of the objects they um they're basically a lot of them are film props so i make i make films music videos and my house is just a weird collection of all these strange things so that one cabinet that's all beautifully organized that's just a tiny like snapshot of what my house is like it's just full of all these weird oddities um, so yeah, so it, it was nice to sort of give them a little bit of a, a platform um, and to show them. I mean, uh, yeah, like I say in the video, there's a there's a lot of objects that couldn't be put in there. So the work that I make, it's it's collaged, it's taking different bits and pieces. A lot of the time, it's perishable things, so meat. Um, yeah, lots of different scanned body parts from different people um that willingly donate their <laughs> their body <laughs> so my work um so so yeah 
I've kind of gone off on a bit of a tangent here, but yeah, that's yeah, it's 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 basically yeah, it's it's collage, it's collage, but three dimensional collage. Well, it's fascinating that a lot of your work deals with the body and maybe portions of the body amputated make you think about death and fragmentation. Mm. And you kind of spend a lot of time really celebrating fleshiness and tactile qualities. For example, could you talk about the little hands, the row of hands that you have? Yeah, so the hands, the hands are my children's hands. They're casts of my children's hands. And I, yeah, I think I mean it's like I reference in the in the film um, the Russian writer Bakhtan. I don't know if many people have heard of Bakhtan, but um, he writes about uh, the grotesque and the carnivalesque. And he writes, it's like a celebration of the grotesque. So he writes that the human is at its most grotesque in birth, sex, and death. So those three themes are something that just run through all of my work. I'm just fascinated with that. And I'm, I'm fascinated with the grotesque because like with all of my work, there's this kind of darkness to it, but it's there's also a humor to it. And I think finding that balance between, you know, dark and, and humorous is quite, um, is quite important and I think it's also that thing where you want people to be drawn in and then they realize what it is they're looking at and it's kind of it's this kind of feeling of repulsion but also you know attraction you can't you can't look away and I think particularly when you see the sculpture and you don't see the objects that have gone into making it the sculpture just looks like this beautiful copper sphere and then you look closely and you see there's penises on there, there's tentacles, there's all these weird animal and human parts. And I just really like, I like kind of drawing people in and then freaking them out sort of thing. So, yeah. <laughs> the hands also feel like they reach out towards you, don't they? And look at the tentacles and the body parts and the fur or the hair as this yeah. kind of element that invites the viewer to engage and touch and then be repelled by what they see in yeah. some respects. Yeah. And the hands, the hands have been used in other projects. So all, all the objects that you see in that first real case and that you'll identify in the sculpture, you'll see in my films, you'll see in other pieces of work. So they're almost like little, you know, little kind of snapshots into other pieces that connect everything together. So in my latest work that I've done, I've used those hands of my children. Um, so it, yeah, it's just a way of, of linking all the, the work together in a way through these objects. I saw the hand piece. Was it you in the bath with them all reaching out to touch you? And it's kind of symbolic of the way that all your time is eroded by this kind of a desire for attention. And it's yeah. really powerful, but I like the way that you use the same image in many different ways mm. it has a, a longer kind of duration of purpose yeah they all have a life and the life travels with me through the through the works and they just morph into different different things in different ways <laughs> so i have a couple of questions here somebody wants to know karina wants to know on a practical level um technicalities I wonder, Karina, if, um, if you want to know the technical details of how you constructed the copper sphere, for example. Okay, so yeah, so the work, um, the work begins with the objects and the objects are scanned. And then the scans are uh, placed onto the metal through a photosensitive emulsion. So they're exposed photographically um, onto the copper and then the copper is etched and then the etch creates a permanence in the metal and then the metal is inked up with ink and polyurethane varnish so it becomes a permanent fixture so all of the prints you see they had to be printed before the sculpture was made because obviously once it becomes three-dimensional you can't print from it anymore so all the prints have to be made before the sculpture is assembled and yeah the sculpture is just 14 facets so it's squares and triangles and they are they have a structure underneath and then they're welded together on that sculpture and uh, the shape is a cube octahedron which probably doesn't mean much to most people but it's yeah it's a 14 sided 14 sided shape so the cube octahedron is in in of itself a wunderkammer because it's yeah. 
collection of all your interests and obsessions. And I think Karina's mentioning here that artists are well known for being hoarders and collectors. And did you see the Barbican's magnificent obsessions? I didn't, no, no. When, when was that? We'd have to have a conversation. Karina, you need to unmute yourself. <laughs> I, go, I go to the Welcome <laughs> Collection a lot because in the Welcome Collection, they have all those Wunderkammers and all this amazing, oh, it's just incredible. And the Natural History Museum and yeah, yeah. That's basically my house, but more organized version. <laughs> and um, Suzanne wants to know a bit more about the thought process triggered by the exhibition. Are you talking about future or past, I wonder, Suzanne? I, I guess for me, what's really interesting is the idea of transformation and metamorphosis, because you talk about boundaries at the edge of your shapes mm -hmm. and um, the boundaries like this liminal zone. And then you kind of flip over into a new facet or you kind of pivot into a new point of view. And that's really fascinating because there's no ending because no. you have this three dimensional shape. So you permanently circling and creating new narratives depending on the way in which the way which round you you decide to read it yeah I find that really amazing in your work thank you <laughs> um i don't know what suzanne suzanne do you want to elaborate a little bit more about the thought processes that you're curious about there's a little bit of silence oh Oh, now. <laughs> so first I would like to thank Laura for taking the hit and being the first or in this series of <laughs> exhibition. And uh, yeah, what I mean by the thought process, it was triggered basically when I went, I think it was two or three years ago, I tortured my children again, taking them to the Tate Modern. <laughs> and we saw this Jack pink glass cube and I was completely I was in awe I said this is brilliant and the children said to me mom why are you so excited it's a boring glass cube and I said yes but I know what is behind it I know how much work it takes mm -hmm. to make the thing that was a kneel for weeks perhaps months the artist took such a high risk to even endeavor mm -hmm. or to 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 think about it because that can go wrong in the last minute. And then I thought, yeah, when you just see an object, you can appreciate it for its beauty, but it's a little, I think the making is really, really important as well. So, and then what I mean is you, you already hinted that it made you show the, the, the stuff you have in your house and probably our houses are quite similar. <laughs> next to my desk is a skeleton so anyway <laughs> but uh yeah what 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 did you realize more what you were doing or did you sort of sort your thoughts to put them into the real cases or what did it trigger i think it was it, yeah it was um yeah it was a kind of org reorganization in my brain because obviously when you're making a piece of work you just sort of travel through it and then when it gets to the point where it's finished and you're exhibiting it all of that sort of previous stuff it just sort of gets put on the back burner or it goes or it you know it's just in the back of your mind ready for the next project it just feeds into that and I think it was yeah it was nice to sort of deconstruct it to reorganize it to think about okay how am I gonna present this thing that's in my brain you know as a visual thing in a case that people can see and, you know, hopefully without me actually talking about it, people can travel through and see the real cases and, and figure out my thought process without even any kind of, you know, interpretation from me. And, I, and hopefully, hopefully that is the case. Um, but yeah, it was, it was lovely. I think, I think when I've exhibited it in the past, it's like you say, people will see it and they'll say, oh, wow, how's that made? Or, you know, they'll have this artist statement. And I think it's nice to actually, give people a deeper appreciation of how it's been made or you know what what's actually happened to get to that final point so yeah thank you for the opportunity to do that it's been really you know really interesting for me as well <laughs> 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 oh. 
time window. Hopefully. <laughs> it seems to me that this invites um, future um, manifestations of the same shape, but with different kind of interactions and different imagery or even maybe different scales and kind of that this might potentially be the beginning or the kernel of a new set of ideas. Yeah, I mean, I've, I have made work. I have made another piece after this, which is a really big um, sculpture on aluminium triangles. It's an isohedron. So it's an eight, eight faceted piece and it's really, really big. And that's called Octopoda. And I exhibited that um, about two years after. So it's using the same process of scanning. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm an etcher and a lot of the work is, you know, two dimensional. And you have these gorgeous plates that, you know, are just, they're the artwork, you know, the prints come from those, it's the plates. And so I've always wanted to use the plates as the artwork themselves. And I like the fact that once you've used them, you can't print from them anymore. There's something quite romantic about that. It's just a real end. It's like, you know, you cannot print from them anymore. You've got this so, yeah. It's like so, an end, it's like a taxidermy, isn't it? You're preserving <laughs> it, but it's taken its life away. So yeah, <laughs> brilliant. definitely. It's like preserved, but it's, yeah. So, um, so yeah, I think I think there probably will be more. And if you see my work, you, it's kind of it, it kind of helps it all make sense because you, you can see this journey of the collage and the scanning of objects and how that transforms into print in different ways, whether it's through sculpture or film or just the two dimensional prints. Um, so yeah, it's been really nice to be able to show just that little you know, little glimpse into my mind of, of how I get to these points in my work. But yeah, there'll be there'll be more sculptures, I'm sure, when I can get in the studio more. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, Laura. And thank you, Won Jin, for, for hosting the latter second part of the of the session. Thank you very much, Laura, for, for letting us into your thought processes and and sharing that visually as well as in, in conversation with us. So, as uh, I, so thank you very much. And, and you know, if anyone wants to stop, I give a round of applause. Actually, applause for everyone. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> Karina, also, Karina also put a, a, a sort of a comment here, which maybe people haven't seen it. But you know, we are, artists are well known for being hoarders and collectors, and this this is where where it sort of all comes to. So, thank you for uh, sort of making some sense out of the the hoarding and uh, the collection the collecting that we all do. And also, uh, as one Jin also mentioned, you know, this sort of um, destroying or making something unusable and giving it an another piece of life is also something, uh, a creative process as well, which brings on uh, another type of work as well. So that's a very nice way of preserving the work and making something else in it. So thank you for, for, for those insights as well. Well, that's, we've had a good half an hour, uh, which was fine, uh, unless there are any more comments or questions um, we can go back onto the uh, onto the table so feel free to sit uh, around uh, and so have a little chat uh, longer if you like um, just the, the, our next session will be on the 14th of April uh, speakers to be con confirmed we've got a few people lined up uh, for, as next speakers and I will send out another invite um, to to invite you all and also please pass on the invites to people that you might think that uh, might be uh, interested or willing to maybe even participate uh, with the presentation. As I said, as it says in the strap line, it's um, a there should be presentations all around the theme, the big theme of print. So whatever it is that we are printing and dealing with, um, then please um, um, uh, let us know, and we are happy to host um, anyone who. Uh, has something interesting to share. Okay, in that case, I shall stop presenting now and we shall see you back on the tables. Thanks everyone for coming. <laughs>